podcasting from Chico, California, tucked in between some of Northern California's best freshwater fisheries. This is the Barbless Podcast, a podcast about NorCal fly fishing, guiding, fisheries management, and sustainability. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, leave the guys a voice message on the Barbless Podcast hotline, area code 530-636-2523. Also check out http colon slash slash podcast.barbless.co, where you can download past episodes and show notes. Be sure to follow them on Instagram at barbless.co and connect with them on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. Fish on. Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of the Barbless Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Hanna, here with uh, Chad Alderson Hi. and Jason Kindup. Hello there. Hey, how's it going, man? It's going well. Thanks for coming on, Jason. No problem. So, Jason, tell uh, tell our listeners, um, you're obviously um, very well um, known on the, on the Feather River. Tell us what you what you do there, and kind of maybe where you're from, and what you know, why how you got into that position. Yeah. So, uh, I was actually a student here at Chico State, uh, biology student, uh, back in the boy. I'm going to date myself here. Back in the <laughs> '90s, and uh, I was uh, I got interested in fisheries. Uh, took a class with uh, in fisheries with Paul Maslin. Did some monology, some uh, entomology, and and I, oh, cool. at the time I got uh, brother in law was really interested in fly fishing, and and so I, I kind of got hooked. And then um, actually I I was thinking about going to grad school somewhere else, and my wife ended up getting a job in Chico, and I thought, well, I can make a program here, and uh, so I went back to grad school here, and did my work on the feather. Uh, I was looking at, nice. uh, yeah, I was looking at. So that was in the '90s. I was in the '90s, yeah. I was looking at Chinook salmon and and uh, red superimposition. So the idea of one one salmon essentially digging up another salmon's nest, and, uh-huh. and so I was interested in that. I was working on Butte Creek too, but uh, the feather just presented a better opportunity just because the numbers of salmon and and uh, so I I was doing graduate work there, and then uh, were you fly fishing on your days off when you when you were out? I didn't have many days off. I was I was a I was also a research assistant, so I was doing uh, work on non-natal streams. So between Chico and Redding, we would go in insane. Um, you know, Tom's Creek and uh, Only Creek and all those little trips from Keswick down to uh, Chico, really Mud Creek, and cool. looking for salmonids ring out off the Sacramento River. So I was doing that a couple of days a week and and writing my thesis, and then I got a job uh, on the feather. Uh, there was a Salmona job opened up there, and I was doing research already, and so in a lot of ways it just fell into place. Yeah, and uh, and you know, and, and leading up to that, I was just became more and more interested in salmon and, and steelhead, and I just you know loved being on the water, and and so that job just seemed to fit everything I was interested in, nice. and and I've been there ever since. So at DWR, what's so what's your position at there? At DWR, so I'm I'm currently a senior environmental scientist. Uh, so I manage a crew of about 20 folks, uh, state and contract employees that that do essentially salmon, steelhead uh, research and monitoring, and to some extent green sturgeon. Green sturgeon stripers yeah. are stripers in that at all? Or? You know, we do do some work. Uh, yeah. You know, our focus there is really uh, obviously Orville Dam has mm-hmm. been in the news a lot lately, and right. you know when Orville was built back in the day. Uh, they didn't think a whole lot about the impacts to, to fisheries. They built hatcheries and they thought that would solve the problem. And, uh, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, there's been a lot of research to document, you know, what happens, you know, at these tailwater fisheries and, and, uh, with, uh, new environmental regulations like the Endangered Species Act in the seventies, uh, new requirements were put on operators. And essentially our job is to, to help, uh, basically yeah. monitor what's yeah. the health of the river yeah. as far as fish and exactly so you know we're there to, to help operations uh you know determine hey if we need to change flows how would we do that how can we yeah. do it in a way that that's most you know beneficial you know if we need to move flows from the high flow to the low flow those kind of things how do we do that so you know we're constantly i constantly work with operations you know my staff um, folks in Sacramento to, you know, manage the system so that we're, you know, creating the least impact possible. It's, it's interesting that you said that they, they attempted to, um, restore fish populations by creating a hatchery, like, a, like it was an attempt. Like, you well, know, 
And you know, back in the day, there were a lot of smart, dedicated people um, doing salmon research and steelhead research. But you know, I think the the thought was, well, this is the easy way to mitigate for lost habitat. We'll just create more fish. Right. And so they did that, and we're you know that's the legacy we're 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 stuck with now. Right. Um, but we're learning a lot about you know hatcheries, how they do and don't work um, with our systems and, and what we can do differently than maybe just rearing fish, releasing them and expecting everything to just work out. Well, what, what are some of the highlights on the do and don't work side of, of that equation? Well, I think what genetics is probably a big one. Genetics right? is a big one. Um, you know, clearly if you are rearing fish in a highly unnatural environment, like a concrete raceway, <laughs> you're, you're going to select for certain individuals that do well in that environment. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know when the last time you walked by a raceway and you threw, fu- threw food, which is pelletized food. It's, yeah. it's, it's basically fish protein that's, that's cast into the, into the raceway. The fish feed like crazy on the surface, right? They, right. It's a very unnatural behavior. So you're really selecting for fish to do well in that environment, right? They see a piece of food, they go for it immediately, very aggressive, um, which isn't always a bad thing, but you know you're really selecting for the fish to do well in that environment. Those are the ones that survive. They're the ones that get planted in the truck, they go to the bay, or get released in the river, and they come back. So if you do that generation after generation, you're selecting fish that do well in that environment. Mm-hmm. And so, so we're gonna have a killer topwater fishery in ten years. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. It sounds like I need I'm to kidding. tie some pellet flies. <laughs> right. Pellet. <laughs> so he's been he's been giving me a bad time about these uh, mop flies. They're starting to sound pretty damn good. Yeah. So that that's kind of a don't. But the the upside is, you know, they can really fulfill a role, you know, right. to help manage stocks that are really in decline. Mm-hmm. So right. it's just there's a balance there, and what we're doing, trying to do more and more now is work with the, the hatcheries to make sure that we are selecting the right brood stock, so the right adults for, for to take eggs from, mm. and that we're uh, releasing fish in a way that will help promote their survival without them competing with the natural stocks that are also out there. So it's a constant balancing act. Can you go into that in like a little bit of a time frame during the year of how, you know, obviously right now all the salmon have come in, you guys are collecting eggs and fertilizing them rearing those fish and then releasing them. Can you kind of go through the time frame a little bit, just brief, real quickly of how yeah. that how that goes down? And then at one point, I mean, you guys are implanting, you know, chips into them and all kinds of, uh, so I just uh, yeah. overview. There's a lot going on at the hatchery now. You know, 10 years ago, it was, you had culturists in there, you know, mixing eggs and milk and putting fish in stacks. Now we have, there's roughly 15 to 20 people in the spawning room. So fish come in, of course, spring runner coming in in, in uh, you know April May June, yep, yep. holding all summer. The the hatchery opens their ladder mid September, so you have spring and fall run mixing uh, in the ladder when they come in. Uh, we actually mark the spring run that come into the feather uh, in the spring with an external tag and put them back to the river so they can hold. Excuse me, hold over summer in the river. Uh, but when they come back in September, uh, they have that mark, so the hatchery sorts them out. That way, you know you're not. We're not mixing spring mixing and fall. Spring and fall we're, right. we're, we're selecting based on run timing because they came in early. That's the best we can do right now with the facilities we have. But, but genetics are, are, have come a long way. So in the future, we'll start using genetics and things like that. Mm-hmm. Wow. But once the, the, we do a lot of um, our mating practices are different now, too. We don't just grab a male and a female necessarily. We do what there's more sizes sort of mating. So there's, they're sizing up the fish more equally. Hmm. Um, you know, and then uh, we track the, the actual gametes. So once the eggs and milk are mixed, those are tracked back into trays, and then those family groups are followed. So we're always trying to make sure that all the diff- the whole run is represented. It's not just, oh, we got a bunch of fish one day, and we're done. You know, we're trying to take fish throughout the run. Those eggs hatch. Uh, you know, they're, they're hatching in, say, November. They get ponded in the raceways, um, you know, in the, in the winter. And then steelhead, of course, are coming in now. Right. Um, they're being spawned right now, which has been a really good good year, by the way. Yeah. And then they'll be, you know, same process, but then those fish will be held in the hatchery for a year before they're released. The, the salmon? And steelhead. Oh, and steelhead. So then yeah. it, it sounds like it's, it's kind of like this ever-changing eugenics program almost, you know, where generationally you guys make some tweaks each time, hopefully... Yeah making the, that strain more resilient. Well, in the wild, uh, you, you see like maybe a buck take over a, a bed and have maybe multiple females come in that he will, you know, um, spawn fertilize. with. Yeah, yeah, fertilize the eggs. Do you guys do, I mean, do you find like a big, you know, 50-pound male and try to get those genetics out there? You guys, I mean, is that? 
Well, there's there's the protocols and there's what like really happens or something. Like yeah, that. there's what really happens in the hatchery. And, you know, yeah. you know, guy sees a big male, he's right. going to make sure it gets spawned, and they do get spawned. We we yeah. want to spawn those guys. They, right. They're they're carrying a lot of reproductive success with them, so yeah. we want mm-hmm. them in the brood stock. Um, but we try to size them up with the, you know maybe an equal size female. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, what's the rationale to do that? Well, it's based on some research that's been done that suggests that that's, that's how fish, some, to some extent, pair up in the wild. Oh, okay. You clearly have jacks that come in. They're going to spawn with females, right? You know, we, I see this all the time on the river. It's fun to watch. You know, you see a, a female digging a nest, and you got a couple big males in there, and there's always, a, you know, a smaller jack, which is, you know, mm-hmm. like a two-year-old salmon, mm-hmm. not a full adult, sneaking in there and fertilizing, which, <laughs> you know, is an effective <laughs> uh, right, you yeah. know, survival strategy. mechanism. Yeah, yeah it works. Yeah. I had um, a few buddies that I used to hang out with at the <laughs> bars that would do the same thing. So. <laughs> That's right. You know, you just sneak, you know call them sneaker males. You can yeah. call them any, all kinds of things. But you know, it works. But uh, you know, it's hard to replicate what goes on the river in the hatchery. I mean, it's really yeah. impossible. Yeah. So what we want to do, you know, a lot of my job is to make sure that we're creating habitat. Uh, we're doing things to make sure that 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 naturally produced salmon and steelhead are doing well and and can return and spawn. So when then they, they return, a lot of these fish have these microchips in, in their head still, and um, a team goes around and basically finds the dead ones, right, and counts them and cuts heads off and does a scan. To- yeah, so coded wire tags are a very, very tiny tag. It's a, It's got a little etched code in it. Mm-hmm. Um, they come in these giant spools of wire, and now hmm. they have these automatic fish uh, tagging trailers um, that, that they can run through, fi- run, gosh, they can run a couple hundred thousand fish a day through these things and, wow. and it's oh and it auto it uh, injects them as it, they pass through. it injects the tag it, it 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 basically grabs the fish mm-hmm. it injects the tag it gets the length and then it cuts the adipose fin if that's the you know if that's the direction wow. i thought that was all done Do by have, hand Do all you, run are by there computer pictures of that stuff somewhere that'd be kind of oh, cool yeah. to put up on yeah. the show notes and the trailers will be running in uh, we usually start the spring run in, in mid February, so they'll be running. And it sounds like a, the cattle corrals, you know, they funnel them in, and then it's like down in one chute, and the thing grabs the cow, and I don't know what they do after that, but it sounds kind of similar. It's very much like that. Yeah, Interesting. just huh? underwater, and yeah, um, but and it's, it's amazingly precise, cool. and and you get a great count, and and uh, so that I had no idea that that was being done. Yeah, so we we hundred percent mark the spring chinook. Uh, from the hatchery, Whoa. mark and clip, and then 25% mark and clip the, the fall run Chinook. And so that allows us to track them, of course, when they're adults. So when they do come back, we have crews in the river that are doing what we call carcass survey or escapement survey, where we're trying to do an estimate of the number of fish actually spawning. Mm-hmm. So we, uh, we, mar- we pull up dead salmon from the bottom, we put a tag in them, we put them back in the river, uh, just and because for the biomass? No, we or? do it as as part of the basically the the process or the statistical evaluation of um, creating this estimate. So there's a certain number of fish that you encounter that are new. You put a tag in them, you put them down the river, and this is what we did on Dirty Jobs, actually. Oh, okay. So with, then we pull, the, and then we the go TV back. TV show with Mike Rowe. Exactly. So then we go back week after week, and we get new fish, and then we have we recapture old ones too. So then we take data on the fish we recaptured, where we recaptured them. That allows you to build a statistical model as to how many fish are actually in the system. Huh. So Mike Rowe came out um, to help with that survey, and and you know what we what we often do with the fish that are too uh, decayed to tag, we just chop them in half, and they're added into the count. So did Mike get to be the uh, the hatchet man? Yeah, he was a hatchet man <laughs> for the day, and uh, it was it was, he was a super nice guy, nice crew. Um, you know, it went well. But, uh, and you know, you got to check out the, it comes on every night. People tell me all the time. Hey, well, I just went, saw your we'll episode. Have, we'll see if Liz can dig it up for us and get it on the show. Notes I think he went guys. to the rendering plant too. That, that he probably did. Yeah. 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 Ooh, that thing. Oh, let's <laughs> not talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was a good day, but it was, uh, it was good exposure for the river and what we do out there. Yeah, for and, sure. You know, it was a good time. So it's, yes. Yeah, um, 70% of the salmon that return are basically, a, uh, from the hatchery, right? That you guys have. Well, we would we would probably estimate it higher than that. Higher than so that. So I, I, you know, for spring, we we do a separate estimate for spring run and fall run, and they're both I'd say hovering around ninety percent wow. hatchery origin. So that's and, something. And that, the steelhead are numbers are way up too. So what? Obviously, you've been doing this a long time. What are some of the high high points and low points that you can go over? Of just what you've seen. I mean, change. Well, unfortunately, you know we. 
we've made good progress, I'd say, in our department in, in terms of working together, uh, our operations folks with our, our fisheries folks and to, to manage the system better. And yeah. then and also working with uh, Fish and Wildlife and NOAA Fisheries, you know, regulatory agencies. You know, we're working way more as a team to actually get things done. You know, when I started, it was it was pretty compartmentalized. You know, operations did their thing. Yeah, that that was going to be my question is how how do you guys set your goals and do you coordinate those goals with say a Coleman Fish Hatchery? You know, is there is there an you know is there a concerted effort strategically? We don't necessarily coordinate with Coleman. Uh, we set our goals to some extent based on what was done um, back when the hatchery was built. Hmm. So initially it was, well, we, you know, we've lost this much habitat fishing uh, at then fishing game said, Hey, we need to, you know, raise this many fish to make up for it. And so about 15 years ago though, we did go through a bit of a review uh, for the spring run program uh, to see if we were really meeting our objectives Mm -hmm. in terms of the number of adults returning. And we weren't, uh, you know, for different reasons, but the goals were pretty lofty. Um, So we adjusted those. Uh, But, but in the end, we want, we want enough fish returning so that we have a successful fishery. We get fish spawning in the river and we fish to the hatchery. Mm-hmm. So, you know, folks will talk about this cohort replacement rate. We want to replace that group of fish at one or greater. So we want, you know, at least the same number returning. So, you know, back in the day, they did, they learned from releases like, hey, we're getting this many fish back. This seems to be working. Hmm. Um, but we've changed strategy over, strategy over the years as well in terms of how we release fish. So uh, we release all the fall run that go to the bay. Uh, like Carquina Straits area, um, although we are experimenting with some in-river releases, but the spring run all go in river now. So we're treating that program now as a conservation program. What do you mean in-river release? You're experimenting with in-river release. I know like the Colomies doing the, the barging, they're some of their fish down. Right. We is, I guess it's been pretty successful. Yeah, we take all our spring chinook smolts. So when they're big enough, you know, three or four inches, when they're ready to transition to saltwater, Mm-hmm. that's when they're, they're they're released and we take all the spring run and we put them down uh, either down at Gridley, uh, the boat ramp there mm-hmm. or Boyd's, Boyd's pump launch mm-hmm. that area. Yep. yep. And we put them at those two locations where the dinger, be- the dinner bell rings and the striper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How big so, is that an issue for you guys? It is an issue. Uh, you know, we're constantly trying to meet a lot of different objectives at the same time. So yeah. we're trying to put fish out that, mm-hmm aren't getting eaten by stripers. We're trying to make sure they get coat of wire tagged first. So they need to get tagged first. They have to be a certain size. Right. So that pushes our window of release back a little bit because they have to be a certain size before you can tag them. Right. So that pushes us further into spring, which w- when the rivers start coming down, they start clearing. The predation's easier. Yeah. Stripers, of course, are coming in. You know, so we're, right. And then we're trying to balance the impact of putting those fish out on top of naturally spawned juveniles that are moving through the right. system. Right. So... You know, it's a tough balancing sure. act. You know, if we can get high, muddy water, that's great. That always helps. Yep. Yeah, uh, I know that in the past, like, well, you you probably saw it when you were working there. The like '97 floods. You know, the river went up to uh, I think 150,000 uh, cfs. We saw tremendous and great fly fishing for steelhead. Like even in the high flow in September, like steelhead were coming in super early, and out of nowhere, um, you know, kind of in the t- somewhere in the 2000s, it just quit. Those fish started stopped coming in like that as, as early as that. It was more like October, November, and, and just saw kind of a – is that just drought? Was that drought situation, predation, all kind of death of a thousand cuts, like I always say? But You know, we still see steelhead come in. Uh, this year's great, obviously. It's yeah, huge this year's – numbers. You know, we do still, still see them come in in the fall, but, um, you know, nothing has really changed as far as operations goes mm-hmm. uh, in the system. I mean, it's been pretty – we, you know, we've had some droughts, of course, but, th- right. you know, the way our project operates is is pretty consistent. Um, the one change has been over the last several years since the Thermolito power plant burned down. Right. Uh, we've been able to the move f- more water through the low flow channel and be more flexible how we move water. Which but, is good, right? For It's got to be... Yeah, it gives us flexibility. Good. It's nice to have flexibility uh, based on what's there and, you know, what's happening at the time. But, uh, you know... I don't know what's going on there as far as steelhead goes, Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, why, but you know, we do still see fish come in early. Uh, You know, there are programs, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife has a tagging program down in the Sacramento, lower Sacramento, where they're using large fike traps. So it's like this giant hoop uh, with, with smaller rings and the fish go in and can't back out and they're tagging them in there. And then those fish then go on to the tributaries. 
so up the feather and other places and they're getting a lot of fish in august coming up right um right. so we're tracking them at the hatchery yep. with some of the studies we're doing so you know they are coming up um the high flows is, is a is a big mystery in a lot of ways what, what's happening down there um for those that you know those of you guys that fish down there and yeah. and know the river yeah you know back in the we've seen it change just a lot back in the early a lot of bigger fish were caught yeah back in the early uh, 2000s uh we had a lot of salmon spawning down there yep i was just gonna say that yeah, yeah and so uh i think part of it might be that there aren't salmon spawning down there as much and so the steelhead just aren't hanging out down there do they they're pushing right through they spawn in live oak down there at all or even yeah further yeah down, they'll, they'll, fish, yeah we yeah. see fish spawning all the way down to sunset pumps Right. Not very many. Yeah. I mean, it's in the there are fractions of them. But back in the early 2000s, like I said, we had, I'd say about 35% of our fish were spawning in the high flow. This is fall Chinook. Mm -hmm. And um, we believe, and we have a paper coming out in the Fisheries Journal here in a couple months that looks at, you know, what the run looked like in the early 2000s and how it changed uh, over about 10 years. And the centerpiece of that whole concept is the, the ocean fishery collapse that happened in 05, 06. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you're very familiar with that, but, no, but not at all. salmon took a, took a big hit. People were blaming the Chinese and or Japanese fisheries. and Yeah. I mean, in the end, you know, the, the information suggested that ocean conditions were just really poor and mm -hmm. juvenile salmon hit the ocean. There was no food available for them. So it's ocean, just a timing thing and the habitat was shot. Yeah. Yeah, ocean currents generally drive production in the ocean, and so if there's no primary productivity, salmon have not, juvenile salmon have nothing to feed on when they hit the ocean. They're small fish. I mean, they don't have much time before if they don't find food, and so there were a couple really bad years um, that happened in you know oh five oh six, and our data we used the ear bones uh, right. of salmon to from two thousand to about two thousand ten. Uh, you can do some microchemistry and actually see where the salmon were spending their time, essentially. Uh, and then what we did was look at the hatchery uh, piece versus the natural piece. And so we said, okay, well, I can identify a hatchery salmon from the ear bone. Um, and we, we compared that over about 10 years. And it, looked, it looks like over that period of time, um, there, was, there were still a lot of natural fish in the feather, fall Chinook. Mm -hmm. And then after the collapse there the the numbers just dropped off um, big time and the hatchery fish just kept going because the hatchery continues to produce the same number of fish but the river just couldn't the returns right. were so low the production went way down that makes sense so all those natural all those wild basically wild fish or natural fish that were down in the high flow just aren't there anymore yeah and and, and the, it might take a little bit for them to come back and the interesting piece about that is that you know the hatchery is a big driver for hatchery fish. I mean, you know, the Feather River is 67 miles long from the Sacramento. Yeah. You know, it's not that far for a salmon to go. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they drive right up the river, right up in the low flow, right up to the hatchery. Mm -hmm. And, you know. You guys uh, are turning them away this year. Yeah. And so, you know, when you have more hatchery fish in the system, you're going to get more fish going up, up the river and less um, spawning further down. And I, I firmly believe that our high flow spawners were a big portion of our natural group. And right. they took a huge hit in those years, right. and, and we haven't seen them recover since. And ever since then, over 95% 90, of the run has been spawning in the low flow channel at, or going into the hatchery. Hmm. So we need to change that dynamic, and hmm. it's, it's not easy to do. Because sure. Yeah, I mean, what, do you, what, do you, what are some tactics to make that, to flip that? Well, you know, we need, we need some, some changes that we're uh, calling for in the new FERC license. So I don't know how, where you are, but you know, we're DWR is waiting for a new FERC license, which is a license to operate the Orville facilities. And in that agreement, there are, it's, there's a tremendous amount of new habitat restoration for the lower feather, uh, from, from gravel restoration to side channels to temperature modifications. FERC is federal energy regulation, regulatory commission. Regulatory commission. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're very powerful. And when they issue the license, you know, our department will go full steam ahead with implementing It'll be a good thing. It'll be a great thing. I mean, we're talking, you know, maybe a half a billion dollars in restoration actions That's going great. into the feather between oh, the hatchery wow. and the river itself. So it's a huge amount of money. I, you know, I've been waiting for <laughs> right, 10 yeah, years yeah. to have Jumping this happen. Bit, I bet. So, uh, you know, we think between hatchery management, restoration actions, we can, we can change a lot of these things. 
Did, were you guys doing some kind of uh, new um, injection method with the fertilized eggs? Uh, was that the feather? I, it I was in I the saw, feather. I saw uh, that in the news somewhere. There. It was like <laughs> fertilized eggs were being funneled down into this basically pipe and then injected into the gra- yeah. gravel, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you're, uh, we, you're cringing like it, it does, you don't like the idea of it. Well, it sounds kind of matrixy to me. Well, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. The Feather River, uh, generally there are plenty of salmon. And, you know, if you want to take fertilized eggs from the hatchery and put them in the river, that's okay. But, you know, the salmon do a great job of creating nests. Yeah. You give them the right habitat, they'll do the job just fine. Do you think people waiting on those nests damage the eggs? I don't think so. They're pretty tough, huh? They are tough. I, You know... The Feather River, one of the things it needs is new, a lot of new gravel. Uh, and so some of the areas was, was pretty big rock, and so you're, not, you're probably not going to damage them. Uh, but, you know, I, I'd say any time you're out there waiting in the river. Yeah, it's, yeah I was about to say, that being sta- said, said, that's not a green field to go stomp around right. on some No, roads. it's definitely not. I mean, But people and, complain about that just in the hatchery yeah. section of, that, of the low flow, you know, and just there's so many people in there fishing that it could cause damage. But, and it, I'm sure it does. Yeah, I'm and sure I, does. I worry about steelhead being caught in January and February in that upper section because uh, they are actively spawning. And right. it's a great time to go fish for steelhead. But, right. you know, they're in, a, they're in a full spawn mode. They're very aggressive. Yeah. Uh, and they're very vulnerable. And, you know, not only angling on them, but then, yeah. uh, you know, we're, we're walking around those areas. So, you know, people are careful. I think it's fine. But people do need to be careful. Um, you, were, you were talking about the ear bone earlier. And you can tell where they've been based on the ear bone. Um, that's come up before, but I never dug in and I meant to next time the ear bone thing came up. Can you kind of, what, what are the properties or the, you know, the chemistry of that bone? You're what's, what's the tell to, to know what, what area of the planet that thing's been on? Well, essentially it's the, the geology of the area is what's driving it. So if you go, if you go higher in the hemisphere, higher up the valley, essentially. So starting up. Uh, like the Sacramento, upper Sacramento, mm-hmm. or those upper tributaries, and you work your way down, the geology is changing. And mm-hmm. so as, as salmon are in the system, they're, they're absorbing all those, those nutrients and chemicals in the water. And so they're, they're, de- they're accreting all that material, those minerals, essentially. And so it's essentially those minerals that are creating the ear bone. So it starts really tiny. And, it, uh, and so when they're really tiny, you can remove the bone and actually see daily growth. So but, layers of it, like an onion almost. Yeah, like a, think of a tree ring, really. That's what I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, well, we're, and then scales, because we had the uh, steelhead episode on, and scales are the same way, but for a different reason, spawning, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, scales are scales are useful, but otolith tells you a lot more. I mean, you can get a lot of information from those scales, because they're not, it's it's the entire life history. Yeah, right? so there, you There's guys, no shedding, there's no changing, right? It's always So there. basically, you'll take water samples or whatever of a specific region, and then you know you'll just basically track that back from whatever sam- ear bone sample you're looking at. You know, it came from this, this area roughly. Yeah. So there have been folks at, okay. at UC Davis and, and Berkeley who've been you know, really developing this research over time. And that's exactly right. I mean, from the water chemistry, mm-hmm. you know, you can tell, Oh, that's, that's, that's clear Creek, deer Creek. There are some, some confusing oh, signals here crazy. and there that look Marine. Uh, I, I think maybe it's the American, I forget that looks a little Marine, but you can, you can track it. Mm -hmm. Uh, as fish, if they spend enough time in an area, um, you know, where they've been essentially. So we were just looking crudely at, at natural and hatchery origin because the feed also is, is is part of the deal to hatchery. So you can look at sulfur isotopes to look at the feed in the hatchery. (laughs) So (laughs) that, that is a great signal because there's a lot of sulfur in the feed and then in the, in the river, it's not nearly as high. Hmm. So that's a great tool as well. But, but for us, we were looking at these strontium isotopes and, and the signals are small, but they're significant and they're different. And so it's a, it's a great tool. Um, it allowed us to piece together 10 years of history that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Yeah. It's like, so it's like CSI almost, you know, you've got the, you guys are doing forensics essentially. Yeah. So the more, you know, we can, it's cool. and at the time we collected the otolith, we, we weren't entirely sure how well we'd be able to use them, but the technology we knew was getting better and better. And at some point we'd be able to take advantage of it, and we were. So it's it's exciting. I mean, it's it's mm. interesting stuff. It's probably one of the first papers to show sort of what what may be happening in some of these systems around the collapse, and and so it's it's interesting. Are you familiar with that uh, that feasible project they're trying to put the salmon up into McLeod and Pitt and Upper Sac? I am a little bit. Um, I like to f- I like to fish the McLeod. I spent some time in the that Bali Baca section, and oh, cool. um, you know there. 
think you know, it'll work? The whole trap and haul thing's tough. Yeah. Um, you know, we built some large rim dams in the valley, and, and uh, you know, adult salmon are going to get in there and do their thing. I have no doubt. They will spawn successfully and, and get uh, fry I'm out. i saying that nature f- kind of finds a way, doesn't it? The question is, how do you get those juveniles out of the system? Right. And in the right system, I think it can work. It's just got to be just right. Because high water, fish move, and all of a sudden that makes... I mean, we spend a lot of our tri- time trapping fish on the feather. I mean, we're trying to not only look at adults and, and the, the population coming back, but we actually then count the juveniles. So we have, I don't know if you've seen our rotary screw fish traps out there, mm-hmm. but they look oh, yeah. like, mm-hmm. you know, we hear yeah. cement mixer a lot. Right. Yeah, know. they do. They right. look like a cement mixer. We're trying to capture juvenile salmon coming out to create an estimate of how many fish are being produced. So we want to know how many adults are being... And you have them all the way from basically low flow down to Tisdale, right? And well, you... we, we have them... We operate traps down just through Live Oak. Okay. So we're really focused on the spawning area, how many fish are being produced. Mm-hmm. But we have other programs in DFW as well that have traps you know, throughout the valley. But it's a great way to get a sense of you know, a, a per capita, if you will, production index. So per female, how many juvenile, juveniles am I getting? And it's a nice way, I think, over time to say, hey, we've done all these restoration projects, and we are, you know, per female, we're getting 1,000 juveniles instead of 500 or mm-hmm. whatever. And, and we've seen... Just from the gravel project we did in 2014 up by the hatchery, we saw a big uptick just from that one project in the number of juveniles produced in the low flow. And that was just a, you know, that was 8,000 yards of rock, just scratching the surface of what we what can we do out there. Do. Well, yeah. Right. And so we saw, you know, those numbers jump up like 30%. So that's really wow. encouraging. And that's eight miles down from where we're trapping them. And that was really, we think, showing up there. So it's very encouraging that not only the females do better, and, th- and that's part of it. The females do better, right? They have mm. smaller rocks. Both steelhead and salmon? We're working, we're, our numbers are based on, on salmon, but steelhead are going to benefit as well. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, the steelhead run and the feather's not huge, so there's, there's definitely habitat for them out there. Um, Why do the females do better? I'm not sure what I... I <laughs> why the females do better. I'm trying to think what I was what I was saying there. Um, as far as getting Oh, down. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, they're going to they're gonna spawn more successfully if the gravel's the right size. Gotcha. So we added that new rock. I mean, it was just gotcha. beautiful. And they, du- they went to town on that stuff. I mean, it was just a beautiful to watch. And so we added more rock mm-hmm. this year. After the high flows this year, we lost a lot of that rock uh, downstream, mm-hmm. which is great. We want that rock to move. Mm-hmm. That's what rivers do. They right. create, we create new riffles. The river's changed a lot. It's it, great well, it's to see. lost 30% of its riffles in the low flow. Is that going to be an issue? You know, I don't know. I, you know, from what I've seen, I've seen nice in, in changes. Like Matthews, we call it Matthews is gone. Um, the lot we call it last chance, you know, just the one right above the hatchery or right above the outlet that had seemed to smooth out a little bit. It did, yeah. Well, I'll I'll tell you, uh, one of the things that we are going to be required to do in the new license is to maintain 10 riffle complexes in the low flow channel, which is pretty much every complex Uh uh, with with adequate uh, salmon and spawning gravel. So as soon as we get that license, we are full steam ahead wow. at, at putting more and more rock in the river. And That's it, exciting. It, it will change. And that yeah. we want. So I should buy some stock and some gravel plant or something. <laughs> it sounds like. Yeah, I think I buy a haul truck <laughs> or a water truck. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's pretty muddy right now, isn't it? We just had a pretty big rain. Is it? Have you seen it? You recently? know, the rivers, it cleared up a bit the last uh, month and then it muddied up a tiny bit, but yeah. I think it's still very fishable. One of my favorite things to do is take a floating uh, pond smelt and fish it like a dry fly up, oh, in, that, yeah. up in that area. And that's what, I don't I don't like going up there because of what you just said. Uh, you know, those fish are up there to spawn and I don't want to go tromp around in there and catch a bunch on nymphs and eggs and stuff. I'd rather go down there every once in a while, throw a dry fly and, and catch, catch a nice steelhead, you know, or, or something. I don't know. That's just the way I look at it. Well, I find it interesting that we don't allow anybody fish for salmon in that upper area <laughs> right. when they're spawning. And that's been the regulation for a long, even though the low flow has been closed to spring run for a long time, it mm-hmm. was closed for a while just to fall run during in that upper area for mm-hmm. spawning for a long time. And, but we don't do that for steelhead. So, mm. you know, it's tough. I mean, it's a, I it's think a they very should, popular fishery. I think just every once in a while, like just one year, just shut it down, you know, just don't let anybody fish there for a year and see what happens or even two years. I well, mean, it'd be kind of, it'd just be kind of neat to see, and I, anglers would, I think, you're gonna get your you tires know. sliced if you keep talking like nah. that. Well, here's the deal. I, nah. I think there are opportunities here that we're not fully exploring. Right. For example, uh, I think there could be an opportunity to have a fishery in November and December up there, 
before fish start spawning. Mm -hmm. They're very, the fish are hot. You know, there's good numbers coming in, right? Because they're still making their way to the hatchery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the hatchery hasn't started holding them yet. So they're, they're staging in there. There's a ton of salmon. I shouldn't say a ton of salmon. The salmon are dying off, but they're yeah. still feeding on eggs, yep. right, that are left. There's still a few salmon around, but the salmon are pretty much done. Yeah, yeah. And the steelhead are in there. They're feeding. They're not spawning. Let anglers go in there and catch and release. And then when spawning season starts, yeah. shut it down. Yeah. But, t- but but don't don't take away the fishing. Just, just change it a little bit. That makes yeah. sense. So I think there are opportunities there that, you know, should be explored maybe. Do you guys, do you guys help set that sort of policy? They could raise a hand probably, but I don't know how far it's going to. We try to, we provide information to DFW. So we, we have great friends over there and, you know, they work hard to try and manage a lot of resources with, with very few resources of their own. Um, so we just try to provide information about where fish are spawning, when they're spawning, what we're seeing, um, because we're out there a lot. I'm sure you've seen us out there. And so we're, we know a lot about the river. And so we just try to give them the best information we have yeah. and, and, you know, hope that they can do their best to make the best decision for the resource. You, uh, you, you'd said earlier that, um, you manage about 20 people on your staff. Are any of those folks, uh, data scientists? Cause it sounds like you guys are collecting a tremendous amount of data and someone needs to basically interpret that data so that you guys can make your strategic decisions. Yes. So we have uh, m- pretty much about half the staff are out collecting data and mm-hmm. the other half are writing reports and, you know, producing publications like mm-hmm. we talked about. So, um, yeah, so we are actively writing reports. And one of the things that's funny, we just had a staff meeting today and we talked about our new website for the department and, and we took everything off it cause they're developing a new one. And I keep saying, Hey, when that new website goes live, we really need to get our, our reports back up there because we've done, we've collected a ton of information. We've written almost all of it up. It's just not easily accessible right now. There's a lot of good information on our FERC relicensing website about mm-hmm. the studies done then, but all the work we've done since then is a bit cryptic to get a hold of. Mm-hmm. So if anybody wants a report though, you can always get a hold of me and uh, you know, we're, we're happy to provide that information. I mean, you know, we're, we're doing a job for the public, you know, so we want to get that information out there. Uh, we're not always the best at doing it and, uh, you know, we need to get our stuff back up on that website, but that's one of our big goals for this year. So if people are interested in what we're doing, they can, you know, find it, read it and, you know, how do they find it? We, well, we have a, our, my actual division is environmental services. So okay. I don't know what the platform is going to look like when the new website design is done, but in the past you could just go to the department of water resources website and they had a, an alphabet at the bottom and you could just hit F for feather and our site would pretty much come up. Okay. So I'm hopeful yeah. it'll be that easy in the future as well. And then we had a list of, you know, reports there you could download, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some staff bios, information like that. So I'm hopeful, you know, that's going to happen again soon. So um, can you, okay, so the other thing that kind of gets in my craw are the, uh, the steelhead report cards. <laughs> I just think it's such an archaic way to collect <laughs> quantitative research. Um, it, how does that work i mean do you guys do you know if they're if the response rate on that stuff is high or it's not accurate i can tell you that it can't. I, I don't think it is at least it's but. not great I, you know it's funny i i obviously fish for steelhead i have a report yeah. card yeah, you know um, so I'm as not, long as your arm first of all it is long <laughs> uh i have i have to admit i have not always filled it out perfectly myself you know i yeah. try to report it but you know, it's the last thing I'm thinking about when I'm steelhead fishing right. for the most part. Yep, and yep. Uh, so, you know, years ago we tried uh, our own sort of Feather River version of that, like to get information from anglers, like, hey, can you help us out? And, mm-hmm. you know, as much as people want to be helpful, it's just not reliable, in my opinion. Uh, I, whether I it's, think so too. Yeah. So I know they've had some transition in that program, who's running it and all that. And it's not, has nothing to do with them. It's just, it's just, it's hard to get good information from so many sources and expect it to be reliable. I I think that's just, it needs to be an app. An app would be great. Yeah. Um, and in the end, there's no substitute for people just being on the ground and doing research and knowing the system or like pit tags, passive integrated technology using, using, yeah. Or the radio acoustic frequency. Did you just Google that? 
I have it written down. Yeah, no. <laughs> like, damn. Well, there's the two type of tags, right? You have the pits and then the acoustic ones. Yeah. Have you found, um, and you have scanners in the hatchery that will scan these fish as they come in. Have you, mm-hmm. Do you guys learn a lot about that? Do you see their movements? You know, do they move quite a bit? Can you go into that maybe a little bit? Yeah. So we, we have, we've done a several different things over the years. So We've done some acoustic tagging of, of wild steelhead, and so we're actually getting some data back right now on that. It's really interesting uh, compared to some of the data we got from the hatchery. So we tagged, I think, just 25 uh, adult steelhead a couple years ago, and we're seeing those fish come back, actually. Very cool. At higher rates than I thought we would. Our previous data from pit tagging at the hatchery was suggesting that maybe 1% to 5% of steelhead would actually return. So we're getting a very low return rate. Uh, on steelhead. And one of the changes, uh, one of the things we're looking at, speaking of hatchery steelhead, and, and um, we're doing a steelhead kelp study right now. So adult steelhead were, that are post-spawn uh, in the hatchery. We're taking the males because we don't want them to repeat spawn in the river. So we're, we're doing a study now where we're actually trucking them to uh, Verona, hmm. some of them, and the others into the after bay. So what we're trying to do is create another opportunity for fishermen um, and then we're, we're, so we're putting acoustic tags in, in a hundred of those to f- see where they go and how they behave. But the goal is to keep them from spawning in, on the natural spawning grounds because they've already spawned in the hatchery. So we don't want them spawning out in the river again. Uh, but then also to give fishermen another opportunity. And to that end, uh, because of everything that happened this year with the spillway, we ended up, uh, the hatchery ended up keeping uh, a lot more steelhead eggs than we would normally keep. Right. I think Eric had mentioned Eric that. said there's Eric about 5,000 extra that. steelhead you guys have. Well, it's more more like uh, three 300,000 extra. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and where are those things? So <laughs> Tell me now. There's still a lot of them in the Some hatchery. Some of our listeners want you to put them in Philbrook. <laughs> <laughs> well, and okay. if you can do it by tomorrow, that would be good. <laughs> I can tell you they're not going to Philbrook, but they are going to be available. Uh, so, don't do. I believe I haven't. I missed the last call, but uh, the plan was to put 120 thousand into the after bay um, in the, uh, over the last two weeks. So there should be 120 thousand out there right now. These are, you know, they're yearlings, but they're still somewhat small, maybe subcatchable or just in that range. So they're going to hopefully do well out there. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. another... Do some hex, hex fishing in summer. I'm picturing the, the scene from Mad Max where it's it's towards the end of the movie and, and there's like, you see on the just on the outskirts of your vision, there's like this massive amount of cars coming <laughs> at Mad Max. <laughs> That's what it's going to be like out there. And just a, it already is like that. <laughs> there's going to be people strapped to the front of it. <laughs> yeah, on the hoods. Yeah, yeah. on the hoods. <laughs> <laughs> So another uh, 50,000 will go in in February into the after bay. Um, they'll be bigger, of course. So they, they grow fast in the hatchery. So in a month, they're going to put on some weight and some size. So wow. those will be catchable by the time they get out there. They grow fast in the after bay, too. They will. So And then we're going to put 500,000 in the river this year in early February, oh, which is about 50,000 more than we normally do. So you know, a couple years from now, I think that run should be looking good. And then, uh, of course, the after bay could be dynamite for the next year. Right. You know, and they'll, couple the, years. they can live through the summer in the after bay then? Yeah, the, no the tail race from the four bay is cold water. Yeah, and so, so let's sack up probably at that thermocline, I would guess. They probably will. Uh, you know, we don't know a ton about how they behave out there. I wish we had the funding this year to tag a bunch of those to see how they respond. And that's the acoustic, right? That's mm-hmm. you would find them with the radio. Yeah, radio yeah, tag. The, the acoustic tags. Um, is there, know, how do you? So how do you track them? Is it just an, you have an antenna, a handheld antenna, and then is there something on the Golden Gate that... Well, we used to have back in the day. We used you know antennas, I've and seen they, that they would fly. On that mad river, yeah, yeah. So that you know that's sort of a wildlife technique now, where they're tracking mm. moose or something like mm. that. But now we have these autonomous receivers that just sit in the river, right? And they just ping all the time. So when a fish swims it's just by, just like a passive. It's not passive, but it's 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 just as effective, and mm. so and it covers a large area. So a fish can swim by. Mm. The tag is pinging mm-hmm. at a certain rate, and you can program it based on how long you want to last. And then, you know, the receiver picks it up. We go download those once a month, and so we know. And so we have a network of receivers in the river that we we manage. And then uh, there's a group of folks at UC Davis and Fish and Wildlife Service and other agencies managing the ones in the Delta. And then NOAA Fisheries has has some even out in the Bay, or I'm sorry, in the Bay and also uh, the, the Golden Are- Gate and in the ocean. 
So we're learning a lot more about because that's the big is, unknown. What, what it, these steelhead do. My, so my first question is: Are those acoustic receivers the data that's coming off of them? Is that publicly available data? <laughs> uh, I'm sure it I'm is. Like, if you're MacGyver, maybe. I think the challenge is, and it's funny we actually had a conversation about this recently, is the amount of data those things are collecting. So not only are, is it collecting tags from, say, one receiver from our fish, but all the others that have been tagged and released out there. So there aren't a ton of studies going on, but it's, it's, we just talked about, you know, you talked about data management and, and yeah, data, data science. science. That's why I asked, you know, because you guys are collecting just a trove of, inf- of, of data, and if you, no one can really, no one has, you got to have the right, right skill set to go through that data. Yeah. Not only to go through it, but to store it and be able to retrieve it quickly. Yeah. So we have, I mean, I have folks that specialize in databases. We have folks that specialize in statistics, uh, GIS. Um, so we're, you know, try to put all those skill sets together yeah. and make sure the data, you know, is getting processed in a way that's useful. And we just, this morning we're talking about, you know, one of our databases having 50 million records of these acoustic, <laughs> you know, detections. So, you know, we're constantly managing those, those yeah, challenges. I mean, if, I mean I, there could be a, a system built that basically takes all that data and becomes almost a decision support system to help you guys with your yields or whatever the goal is, you know, if it's yield, for example, and it would, it would tune, it could tune based off. Yeah. Maybe in the future, maybe in the future, that'd be, that'd be amazing. You know, it wouldn't be so, so manual. I mean, you know, we have automated systems, but it's challenging when you have that much data to, to process Mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense. But we, you know, we have people dedicated to doing that. I mean, we are, we are invested in the feather, um, you know, whatever data we're collecting, we are, you know, fully intend to get that information out, to get it processed in a way that people can understand it and use it to make, you know, good management decisions. So that, that's our, really our ultimate goal. You guys are obviously really good at um, creating all these hatchery fish and, you know, following them and putting them back in the river and studying them. Is there, is there a project or is there something that's going to be done in the future to create more wild fish? Well, I think our ultimate goal with the settlement agreement and the the requirements on our new biological opinion that go along with that is to create habitat conditions that will help that, create more wild fish. Gotcha. But also to manage the hatchery in a way that doesn't give them the huge advantage that they've always had. So we want to maintain that program. We, we definitely want salmon to be put out for harvest. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that's, it's important for us that, mm-hmm. that, you know, the commercial fishery thrives that, you know, the fishery in the river thrives, but, but that there's a balance there. We yeah. need to, we need to make sure natural origin fish are, are getting their share. So, you know, I would say the bulk of what we're doing in this new license is improving habitat so that, you know, uh, natural, awesome. naturally spawning so salmonids great. will benefit the most. And I think we've seen that with that gravel project. I mean, mm-hmm. we, 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 the unique system or set up in the feather is that we have the salmon, you know, to create more salmon. I know that seems simple and kind of silly, but not a lot of their systems have an abundance of fish where if you provide the habitat, they're going to really uh, thrive on that. Yeah, and so yeah. we've seen that, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that when we get those projects going. Yeah, and when you guys say wild fish, um, that's a, a hatchery fish could can rear a wild fish. It's just it, the, de- the it's basically if the fish was spawned outside of the hatchery, it's wild. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I have okay. no... Because there's no, there's probably no, no like pure a, DNA in the water at this point. Well, I think that's probably unlikely, but, you know, these fish are amazingly resilient, and we're not going to breed out, you know, 30 million years of evolution right. in in right. 10 generations, yeah. you know. So right, right, right. I'm not a purist in that, that whole sense of hatchery and wild. We have a system that's been highly altered. We have an opportunity with with a hatchery and, 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 and improvements in the river to allow those hatchery fish to spawn in the, in the wild, have natural selection take its place, and, and keep promoting that. And that's what we need to do. We can't say, oh, well, you know, you're hatchery, so you can't be here. I mean, we need to have some controls over right. that. We want to continue incorporating wild fish in the broodstock at the hatchery, but we have to start somewhere. I like the idea of going up above the dam and using those genetics to maybe maybe – recreate the fish that used to be here right mm-hmm. i don't i don't know I would, we say that i say that because we we have recently we caught about some, it a lot caught some fish above the lake and just, they just look like the purest trout 
and they're and you've ever seen they're hot you know <laughs> yeah no there's you know um they're pissed it's just like pilot peak you know the hot and cutthroats that they found and reintroduced back in i wonder if is that a I mean, am I talking out of my ass? No, spider? you're not. Uh, you know, they're a geneticist. You know, we haven't talked about the Eel River strain on the American, but uh, I know Is that, that where they introduced them, the Eel River strain? They put them on the American? I thought it was the feather. Yeah, the American. Okay. And so that's why the American tends to have larger steelhead. Uh, and they, they took their, you know, back in the day, fish were being moved all over the place. Sure. Right? It was yep. like, oh, let's put them here. Let's yeah. see what takes. Yeah. While the, the Eel River strain took on the American... But there's a lot of talk about, well, this isn't the right strain for this area. You know, that's a tricky one. But the geneticists are, I think, suggesting that, you know, look, uh, we need to look above the dam for yeah. the genetics to to rebuild the, the steelhead below it, the system. So it makes sense, man. There's fortunately there's the feather, you know, the steelhead we're working with are are, are our feather steelhead, yeah. the spring chinook were, right. were evolved there. We just right. need to do a better job of managing them in the in the compact system we have. And right. we have plans to do that. Uh, you know, the segregation weir. I was just going <laughs> to, I was just going to ask you that you, you run that project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's a, well, you know, like I said, we don't have our FERC license yet, but one of the requirements and in, in that new license is to put in a segregation weir to basically protect spring Chinook, uh, from, you know, the impacts of fall run Chinook spawning on top of them. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the challenge of course, with that is wherever we build this structure, fall run Chinook will no longer be able to access the hatchery. So right now, you know, fish just swim up and they volitionally, volitionally enter the hatchery. So wherever we build this structure, we're going to have to actually collect fall Chinook at that location yeah, and probably releasing. transport them to the hatchery uh, uh, by truck. Uh, now, that's not that hard to do. I mean, to meet the hatchery's production goals, you know, you're talking 7,000 adults. That's, that's no big deal on the feather generally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, moving those is not easy, but they're going to a terminal location. They're going to be spawned there. It's not like they have to sit and hold for another six months. Um, but you know, a lot of concern has been raised over what's going to happen to fall Chinook below the weir. Uh, our goal, uh, at this point conceptually is to make sure we, when we put in that weir to protect spring Chinook, uh, that we enhance the habitat below for fall run Chinook. Um, uh, but hopefully my ultimate goal would be to have a fishery, uh, in the low flow channel again for fall run. Um, which is not long ago it was, you could catch salmon. Yeah. I mean, if we're, if we're protecting spring run above the weir we're doing the right things uh, and potentially steelhead but steelhead could be above or below but um you know we maybe we close that area for for salmon fishing right because that's where spring run are going to be uh, spawning and rearing um but maybe open up the fishery below the weir for fall run chinook that are going to be stacking in there um i think it's a win-win for everybody but still create the habitat for fall run chinook below there you know there's plenty of habitat down there we just need to keep keep improving it uh, which we will do in the new license. And then, you know, we think fall run Chinook can thrive. The hatchery is going to continue doing what they do, which is produce a lot of fall run Chinook for harvest, right? Those are still going to go out to the ocean and be caught in the ocean fishery. You know, we need to do more in the river, but I think the segregation we're, um, you know, I think creates a lot of stress among folks, but, you know, our, our intention is to make sure that it meets our conservation needs of spring Chinook, but also, you know, we Open improve. some windows for anglers and yeah. the public. Hmm. Open some windows for anglers, but also, you know, try to improve conditions for naturally spawning fall Chinook. Yeah. I mean, are, are, do you guys work with any, um, uh, just, you know, organizations that are, you know, private nonprofits that kind of help you guys with this kind of stuff? Or is it, is the budget pretty much your burden? It's pretty much our burden. Um, it's funny you mentioned that because I, you know, when I first started on the feather, I didn't really know you know, I didn't know much about it. I, I'd fished it a time or two in college, but didn't know, really know, you know, sort of the history around it. And as I spent more time there and doing research there, I, I realized, you know, it's, it's a tremendous resource, but nobody seems to care about it. And I know the fishermen do, right. but if you look out at the NGOs and others, it seems like the feathers sort of like, yeah, well, it's just happening. It's, it's the hatchery is the problem. You know, instead of thinking, man, we have a tremendous resource here. What can we do to help? What can we do to help shape? And so people did come to the table during the relicensing process mm -hmm. to say, hey, we want to see this and that and then that. And that was helpful. But I think we need more folks, you know, that, that fish the river, uh, that love the river, to say, you know, we need to protect the river, do these, you know, we need to implement those license actions. We need to clean up the river. And, you know, Feather River Parks District's doing a good job of having a cleanup every year. 
It's just, I feel like it's a bit of a forgotten stream and it's a critical one to the Central Valley. Well, it's, it can be disgusting sometimes just seeing, you know, what's going on on the banks of that river, the, yeah. the homeless and uh, just po- polluting and Needle. it's, it's and terrible. Chad wanted to go back and just pick up, spend a day picking up trash. I mean, it was that thick. It was, it was everywhere. And that was kind of after the big waters had come through too, but... Um, What's your craziest? You've, you probably have some good stories of oh, yeah. working out there on the on the river and along the river. Do you have anything that yeah. sticks out? <laughs> so, oh yeah, uh, you know, my, <laughs> it's like which one and how much time do we have? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I can. have a buddy. I have a, my friends have a good. One. I, I want to. The guy was basically just naked out there. You know, it looked like he just got out of one of the, the prison right there, and he was just you know kind of crazy looking, yelling at him, and they just went the opposite way right that's but probably a th- good call things like things like that that if you uh yeah i've seen uh naked people out there <laughs> doing <laughs> doing things yeah absolutely um i think the whole crew has probably i mean it's right. a it's a it's a an amazing system but it's uh seems to be a, a hub for for some of that kind of activity sure. so you know, I don't know. I, but, I was hoping you had a good raunchy story for us. Well, but the key, I think the key, the key <laughs> is to our, get people out there, baser, right? Yeah, get fishermen out listeners. there. Yeah. Get fishermen out there. Keep them out there. Yeah. They're keeping an eye on right. things. And, you know, the wildlife area especially, right? It's kind of a, it's a yeah. big area where a lot of natural land and people kind of hide is, out it there. It is a cool area. A lot of, there's everything that's out there. Turkeys, deer. I mean, it's a, <laughs> well, it's a neat area. I, I want to bring it back to what people can do to help you guys out for real quick. So... You said, you know, the, the people that are out on the river using the river. Is, are you talking more from like a voting perspective? Is it more of a civic responsibility thing or what, you know, how, what, what action can people take to help you guys out? Like, where do you need help? That's a good question. I think, and I, I believe that in the past, fishermen have been pretty vocal with the Fishing Game Commission. Mm-hmm. Um, in their in their needs and interests, but I think there could be more of that. Like you know, this is what we see, and I, and there are groups out there. I know NorCal. Um, gosh, I, f- I forget the organization right now. NorCal Fishing Guides, uh, mm-hmm. maybe, and, and Golden Gate Salmon. They're you know they're 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 advocating. Uh, I just think we need to be um, communicating less in an adversarial way and more of a, Hey, how can we share information? What do you team. see? I yeah, mean, be a team. I've worked with, you know, JD Ritchie and, uh, you know, he's, he's done contract work for us. And, mm-hmm. you know, when we communicate, you know, he knows we're out there to, we're doing our best out there, you know, to understand the resource, to better the resource. And we've communicated on, you talked about stripers and hatchery releases. He said, Hey, we're down here fishing. There's striper everywhere. You know, can you hold that release off? Mm. All right, let's do it. So I work with the hatchery management to say, hey, can we do that? And sure, well, let's do it. So we can do those kind of things. We just need to communicate instead of say, DWR, you're all bad. You know? Do you guys do you guys have any programs in place that are like you know community outreach focused? Where I'm specifically what I'm thinking of is almost like a focus group where you get you know the the guides that are that are you know on that river a lot and could help you guys give that insight for foot feet on the ground. You know that that insight to more be a little more collaborative in terms of what you get how you guys are working together if there is if there is some friction there maybe it's just a matter of opening those communication channels if they're not there yet we don't but i think that's a great idea uh you know one of the things that will be created with this new FERC license is this ecological committee Mm -hmm. and that committee uh it it has a certain number of uh participants now so the city of orville Mm -hmm. obviously the resource agencies um, but, but other groups can petition to be on that. That's more of a formal setting, but, mm-hmm. but I do think that that's a great idea. I mean, I'm, I'm open, you know, to feedback, you know, I, we get, I get busy with my job. I mean, I have a lot going on and so I get siloed sometimes, but I'm, I'm always happy to, you know, speak with somebody. If Or maybe just put a face, prop up a Facebook group, you know, and just people will invite the people that, you know, just kind of just kind of you know snowball let us know when you drop those fish in and boids and we can go down there and and rip on them with flies and you know the stripers jump all over protect protect the you know (laughs) we've got um you know we started a facebook group uh what about a month ago and we've got 85 people on it that are mostly guides nice so it can happen it had can happen quickly you guys have a much bigger audience than we do so it might be a good way to you know and and an easy way one of the things about getting that kind of participation is you got to make sure that there's not a lot of friction in terms of engagement engagement friction so if you like hold an open house at say in oroville and there's people in chico that can't get over there at 7 p.m that's tough but if they can do it from their desk or they can do it 
on their own time and still engaged, then it's got a ton of value, right? No, it's a great idea because I think all the engagement to this point has been, um, you know, the department on one side and everybody else yeah. sort of screaming at them. It shouldn't it, be that way. The department doesn't want that. It's just, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a hard time communicating all the information. Uh, and, and I, you know, from the river's perspective and what we know and, and what we see out there, we're happy to communicate and, and be available to yeah. people. So yeah, I think it's a great idea. And you know? from a PR perspective, if you get those, you know, you have folks to buy in, then they become proponents of what you guys are doing. And it's not so, you know, it's not like you guys are fighting an avalanche of people bitching. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which, which we're fighting a pretty big uphill battle. Yeah. Right now. I'm, I imagine. Is there uh, plans to remove the sediment that's down there that's gathered from the spillway? You know, that conversation comes up a lot. Uh, I, as I understand it right now, there are no immediate plans. Yeah. But, you know, what happened with the spillway uh, is, I think, different than what happened in the river. And so I think we have to think about that sometimes. The, the material that deposited, you know, the diversion pool is that area below Orville Dam. It's about four miles long. It's a pretty long, deep channel. And, you know, we've excavated pretty much all the material that came out of the spillway and that cavern that was created Mm -hmm. out of the diversion pool. However, we had high flows and, um, you know, maybe slightly different than normal. But in in the end, you know, a lot of material moved. Banks sloughed. Uh, I don't know if you were, you know, the Yuba River was dumping a tremendous amount of sediment well after the feather was done. I don't know if you remember seeing that, but it was, I was shocked when I saw it the first time. I thought, wow, Mm -hmm. Uh, there was some, there were a lot of orchards sloughing in there. And so I think a lot of the material that ended up at the mouth of the Yuba right there at the Yuba city launch is probably from that. But, but that doesn't mean that, you know, the department's not considering those things. Um, You know, those are things are always out there, but you know, I think everybody has to realize that you know, when rivers have big high flows, they change. Yeah. And just because we place a boat ramp somewhere doesn't mean that's always <laughs> going to be a, a perfect spot for a boat ramp. Get a smaller boat, and it'll you know, always be there. <laughs> I, I boated the river from Sunset Pumps to Verona uh, maybe three weeks ago, and it flows are at twenty four hundred cfs, which isn't really low, but you know, it wasn't a bad boat ride. Um, things had changed. Um, the low flows change. You said some riffles have have flattened, and that right. gravels moved. Right. But I feel like we've just, yeah. You know I. <laughs> We just need to get to the next step. We need to get to where we're rebuilding these riffles, right? And yeah. we're adding rock all the time so the river can do those things. The yeah. river will sort out where the rock goes and doesn't go, and it'll create the right habitat. This has all been super informative and helpful for me just understanding this whole picture of the Feather River. I mean, yeah. I've learned so much just talking with you right now. Um, thank you for coming and, and doing this. Um, stripers, I know we talked a little bit about it, and we talked to a lot of people about this. Uh, do you feel like they're a, a predator that's screwing up that fishery or? I think it's a huge problem. Uh, yeah. you know, I'll be honest. I, you know, they, they, they're a perfectly evolved predator to eat uh, small salmon is moving out of the system as you know, they're coming in when, when the juveniles are going out. Yeah. And so, uh, their life history allows them to move back and forth from the Delta to the ocean, right back up the river. And, you know, we see them year in and year out. We've been doing predation studies on stripers and they eat a lot of salmon. So, you know, that doesn't mean that we're not trying to work with, uh, you know, hatchery management to manage our releases. So we minimize that impact. Um, but you know, for natural salmonids, that's tricky. Um, fish bio said they had as, I don't know, do you know the tag that they have that it's like a, the predate? Yeah, they predator, have new tags now. Tag that- yeah. You know, that kind of technology is great. And yeah. in five years, I bet it'll be amazing. Right. And, and right now, you know, it's, I think it's a bit of in its infancy, but it sure. definitely helps to track, is that a salmon that had a tag and got eaten by a striper and is now moving up a river? <laughs> right. So, you know, part of interpreting that acoustic data is, is are the movements mm-hmm. of the fish. So, uh, but in general, yeah, I think stripers are, you know, a problem, but I know it's a popular fishery. You know, we, we get that. Right. Um, so we just do everything in our control to make sure that we can, you know, uh, provide, you know, the right habitat, uh, for salmon so they can survive and just make predation harder by water management. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, we only have so much control. I, at least I do. I mean, you know, um, the, the project was built to store water and, and deliver water in the summer. And so the hydrograph is not always in our favor, right. but you know, a lot of these, um, uh, reservoirs, even Orville, you know, can't hold it all back. And so, um, you know, we have plenty of times where we have good conditions for fish to move out, but a lot of times during the drought, we didn't. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You guys have done a great job with the resources that you have available. Well, I think we're I I think when one thing people should know is we all we're, we care about the river. I mean, we're out there every day. You yeah. know, the people that work for me we, and yeah, everybody you fish it yourself. So yeah, like, and and everybody that I work with at DWR is trying their best. You yeah, know, everybody we've talked to on the government side has been there. You can just tell they're trying to do the right thing. You know, no one's out there to for any nefarious reasons or anything. They're really trying to make a difference. Yeah, and it, and it, you know sometimes it's tough. We have you know, competing interests at times, but we are always working, you know, all the time to make sure we're, you know, doing our best to make sure that whatever resource it is, is, is getting what it needs. So yeah. it's tough. You think next year's run is going to be pretty good? Well, I think so. Or I think maybe we saw three. a lot of, we saw a lot of small fish come back this year, uh, Chinook. So I think it's going to be really good. You know, this year was really interesting because, you know, the, the guides killed it at the outlet. Right. Uh, the hatchery got a ton of fish. You were turning them away. Like 25,000, and we just didn't get a lot to spawn in river. And I've never seen it quite like that. Um, Usually the river gets its share. Is that because of the high flows flattening on all the spawning beds and stuff? They just didn't stop. I mean, they just went right through the low flow and right up into the hatchery. Uh, There's a lot of good rock out there. Right. Um, You know, it's not all perfect, but, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) believe me, I've seen salmon spawn and stuff that you feel like, what in the world is going on here? So... They don't care that much. If they want to stop and spawn, they're going to stop and spawn. Are there any working theories on why they just boogied right up to the right up to the hatchery? Well, you know, no. Flows <laughs> I, were high I, through I don't. the spring. Right. Flows were high through the spring, but you know, usually our fall run come in through August. You know, yeah. some, they start coming in July, but yeah. July, August, September, a lot of them hold at the outlet. Um, but but our operations at the outlet this year weren't that different than than historical. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we're always pretty high in the summer. We bring the flows down by October 15th, right? Which is exactly what we closes, did this year. Right. The yeah. And that's exactly what we did this year. And, and, and in previous years, salmon have held at the outlet. I mean, you remember, you know, the days when it was, you know, the outlet was, you know, true combat fishing. <laughs> like it, Oh, it wasn't this year. I saw it for the first time. And I was like, well, Holy Christ. it was bad, but it's been worse. Oh my God. I've seen it way worse. Oh. So as far as numbers of anglers, you right. know, maybe, maybe more boats this year in the hole. But yeah. but the bottom line is, you know, there were fish there. They were harvested. But the ones that did keep going just went right up to the hatchery. And I think this is part of the problem we talked about before. It's not that far for them to go. We don't really have any tools to keep them in the river. Mm-hmm. If we just send them back out the pipe, they're probably going to come right back up. Um, so, <laughs> you know, managing that is going to be hard for us in the future. We're going to have to think harder about how we you know, manage the fishery, manage the hatchery and what's actually spawning in the river. Wow. Mm-hmm. Sounds like you have your hands full. It makes more sense why Eric in that episode said that he didn't really mind people aligning those, the salmon now. Right. There's, there now was that it make, an it makes abundance more sense. of them. They, they basically needed to be cut, caught. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we want to thin the herd, those fish much. to be harvested, but we want fish spawning in the river too. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, you know, that balance is tough. It's always going to be tough. Um, we may, maybe we need to do things differently at the hatchery. The segregation where will be an opportunity possibly to keep less fish going into the hatchery, right? Cause we'll be able to control them at the weir. They'll get their brood stock, but we'll have a fishery below for fall run Chinook. Uh, but it'll be on the spawning grounds or, you know, before they start spawning, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it'll give us some opportunities to sort of better control what's happening out there. I think we're, we have systems now where we need to be, I hate to say it, but a slightly more aggressive management, you know, more hands-on mm-hmm. management. We can't just lay back and say, yeah, it's going to work out on its mm-hmm. own. Did we, did we already discuss where the weir was proposed to go exactly? Right above the outlet. Okay. Right. Well, our requirement says above the outlet. So um, it could be anywhere in that stretch. It could be anywhere in that stretch. We've, we've been looking at different locations. Um, you know, we're trying to strike that balance of maintaining, you know, habitat for spring run because mm-hmm. we do have, um, a pretty strict requirement in our, in our biological opinion that says we need to maintain a self-sustaining viable population of spring run Chinook above that weir. So they need to have a certain amount of spawning and rearing habitat, but we're fully aware of the potential impacts for fall Chinook. So we need to be, you know, very careful about that. So we've been looking at very hard. We've been doing some engineering studies, some biological studies to see what the area can support, you know, what type of infrastructure it can handle. So, you know, we're thinking very hard about it, but I can almost promise you that whatever we do initially will not be permanent. So we'll put something in temporary and learn. Just to kind of field test it before you. You know, we know a lot about what salmon do and spring run, but we don't know everything. 
and we don't know how they're going to respond to it, and we don't know how the fall rain will respond. So we need to make sure we're testing and understanding what fish are doing before we, you know, do something long term. And, and is it correct to assume that boats will not be able to go over that past that? No. We are definitely going to make sure there's boat passage. We don't want to impact angling any more than we have to or access to the resource. That's, you know, that's a critical component of our our thinking. Interesting. Um, You know, we don't, you know, the only thing that that will be required is a 200-foot closure on either side, or 250 feet on either side. Yeah. yeah. But we're also considering that in terms of the design, like where we place it. You know, what's Mm -hmm. that going to, how's that going to impact the fishing? You know, so we want to make sure we minimize that as much as possible. So that's a big part of it, you know, recreation, aesthetics, Mm -hmm. you know, safety, boating, um, you know, engineering, obviously biological, but, but everything comes into play. We're not discounting anything. Are there motors allowed above Highway 70? It's funny you ask that because I thought for the longest time there were not, but there are. I thought it's a city ordinance that you can't. I thought it was too. And we dug into this probably three or four years ago because I think somebody was asking to take a boat up there or something. And mm-hmm. I said, you know, I've heard that too, but I don't really don't know. And and we found out that, yeah, there's no ordinance um, to take mm-hmm. a boat up there. I've seen a couple guys boat up in drift boats yeah. up to lower auditorium. And, yeah. and uh, you know, from there it's kind of the end of the road, but, right. but uh, yeah, you know, hmm. motors are good. And I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, one of the improvement projects we do um, going forward is better access uh, at that Table Mountain Bridge there right below the hatchery. Yeah. So yeah. people can get more in there. I oh, mean, good. you can't, I don't think you can have, you know, drift boat access would be tough. I mean, you could imagine six drift boats up in that area. Right. It'd be kind of messy, yeah. but but better access, maybe rafts, maybe just easier for folks to get in and out, you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Cool. This has all been so great. Thank you very much for coming in. It's been nice getting to, getting to meet you and um, you have to come out fishing with us sometimes. It sounds like you're not getting out enough. So I'm definitely not. I heard, I heard you killed them when you went out there and I was, I was fun, very yeah. jealous and I, <laughs> oh guys, I, I've been strapped to the office. a new cat's record for the department I heard. I know. And I've been strapped to the office and Kyle told me, I said, oh man, you, you know, I said, <laughs> and you know, I, I hate to say it, you know, a lot of our guys, you know, they fish, but they're not hardcore fishermen. I yeah, probably yeah. fish the most on the crew, uh, outside of work and, mm-hmm. and, uh, I was like, well, yeah, you're using too short a leader, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have a short leader. You got to get I down there. It, you know? I lengthened his leader, and it was game on. I was like, like just yeah. cast that in there. Maybe next year you fish. guys get more guides, and you could cut your survey. We'll just put some funding half, the, to the side, and just pay me to take you down there next year. Though. Yeah. So, <laughs> and and you know the reason <laughs> I and I should fun. say, and I know we're you know need to wind up, but I should say you know the reason we are out there is because uh, we we do have a requirement uh, to estimate the abundance of steelhead in the river. Sure. And so. For a long time, we thought we were going to get the license. For the last 10 years, we thought we were going to get the license and we're going to put a count weir in as well. So I don't know if you're familiar with that concept, but Mm -mm. it'd basically be somewhere down below an area we call weir riffle about a mile and a half above the outlet. So it's kind of hidden in there. We call that steep. Just below steep. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so about, so uh, maybe half mile or so below steep uh, is an area we call weir riffle. and, And so we're planning a weir in that location and it would just be to count fish. So it'll be a count salmon steelhead and uh, maybe green sturgeon if they do come through there. Um, but the idea is, you know, for us to do anything, we need good numbers. We need to know how many steelhead are in the system. Mm-hmm. We need to know how many salmon are in the system. And so we can't manage without basic information. And it's, it's maddening to me that we don't have it now. In any event, <laughs> you know, that, that, uh, that count weir is going to get us that. But, but we've gone 10 years without you know, in some ways meeting that requirement. We've relied on the hatchery data to say, well, yeah, we think we know how many are in the system, but we know enough about the river. Know there's a lot of fish out there, potentially. And what comes in the hatchery is very different than what's in the river. We've seen in the last 20 years, you know, 90, 90 to 99% of the fish in the hatchery coming into the hatchery steelhead, of hat, they're of hatchery origin. But we've known from snorkel surveys and other surveys that the fish in the river are not, uh, don't compromise or the, the component of hatchery origin is much less, probably more like, you know, 60% hatchery origin. So um, anyway, hmm. the weir was going to be our savior for a long time. And after 10 years, I just said, we got to meet this requirement. We need to better understand what's actually spawning the river. We can't just do red surveys. So we move forward with this mark recapture study. And that's what we're really doing is trying to generate an abundance estimate of how many fish are actually using the river. Because until now, we just have no idea. 
And we, you know, we just can't have that. We need to understand the resource in order to manage it. And I know it looks bad. Um, I know some people are, you know, have been upset about it, but, um, we learn a ton by doing that. Sure. And, you know, the alternative is to go below, uh, the 70 bridge and fish with all the other fishermen (laughs) and ruin their fishing. And (laughs) that doesn't work for me. Yeah. Um, so I knew we'd take some heat for it, but you know, it's a requirement. It's really important information. And, you know, we try to be as careful as we can with these guys and learn as much as we can and, and not impact the fishery. So I like your idea of changing it, changing this, the time frame on it a little bit earlier in the year and shut it down when they're spawning. That's, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. The, the Chinook are pretty much done by, uh, November 1st. Um, yeah. and the, but the salmon are still feeding on eggs and there's still a few in there spawning, but I think there's very little impact. The steelhead are feeding on eggs. You mean? Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. So the uh, we hatchery fish after hatchery fish after hatchery fish on an egg. And then I, you know, we tie on a nymph and wild fish, wild fish, wild fish. Mm. I mean, it was like six in a row. Yeah. We're eating that bug. And I mean, it makes sense, right? The, those wild fish maybe have spent more time. Is it a mop fly? Eating a <laughs> 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 uh, caddis, bird's nest. Mm. Um, a lot of big, a lot of big hydrocycid caddis out there. Yes. Yeah. 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 So you guys. You guys study that too, the entomology of the river, and do you have anybody on staff that that only does that? So we need we're trying to find somebody to come in and talk to us. We about don't bugs. anymore. We used to. Um, that's one of the things that got me into fisheries was was bugs and aquatic bugs. But yeah. um, we used to do some um, benthic macroinvertebrate studies. Now the guys uh, the the guys that do most of that are out of northern region, mm. uh, their office. So, um, but it's not something we intensively do. But we did do as part of that gravel project in 2014. We did do some macro, uh, they did some macro invertebrate uh, studies associated along with that to mm. look at how the community changed based on the gravel. So mm. I haven't seen that data, um, but I've seen previous data we've collected out there and we've done stomach content work with steelhead and with Chinook to see what they're feeding on. And it's mm. interesting. They definitely feed differently, uh, little steelhead fry and, and Chinook. Yeah. Very cool. Will you, will you come back and talk to us about some of the things that you find out over the next year and... Sure. Good hopefully, I can. This. Hopefully, I can talk to you about how we're implementing the new license. That'd be amazing. Wait, you know, is that be potential this year? It's a potential. Yeah. Yeah. You when know. you guys, when are you supposed to find out? Well, it's up to FERC. You know, right. we're done. We've done everything we can do to. Uh, what the FERC? FERC. <laughs> yeah. You know. You know. <laughs> Twenty seventeen was a rough year, uh, and so I think there was a lot of um, hesitancy to issue a license with everything going on. But, you know, dam safety at FERC does their thing and, and, you know, the licensing folks can do theirs and, and, uh, you know, but if we can get the license this year, we're going full steam ahead. I awesome. mean, and so in that Very case, cool. we do want folks to participate. Yeah. We want engagement. One of the things we've talked about is having, having public meetings or whatever. I to, would leverage talk some about, electronic, man. Just use a Facebook group. It's going to save yeah. everybody a ton of time. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. So you can do it in a, two minutes. Yeah, but one of the cool things we want to do with the count where was it was have um, like an IP camera in there so people can see fish yeah, passing. Oh, that'd be so cool. We would post counts, you know, regularly oh, yeah. so people know how many salmon are coming in the system, how many steelhead are in the system, that'd be rad. when they're in the system. So, you know, that will give us the opportunity to do more of those things. Um, it'll free up funding for those kind of things that, you know, we can't do yeah, right just now. Just please make an API that's publicly available <laughs> so we can get to it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, Jason. Really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, come back, chat with us. Yeah. And let's get out on the water. Thanks so much for coming in. Do some fishing. I'd love to go fishing with you guys. That'd be awesome. Sounds good. Well, you probably want to fish with Nick. I'm just kind of, eh. We'll go float. We'll have a good time. I I need to learn more, more techniques. (laughs) All right. (laughs) All right. Thanks again, man. All right. Thank you. This podcast would not be possible without support from our sponsors, Fish Bio and Amp.Build. FishBio is a consulting firm that offers a fresh approach to fishery science. They specialize in fish research, monitoring, and conservation with innovative uses of technology and communication. From their offices in Chico, Oakdale, and Santa Cruz, California, to Vientiane, Laos, FishBio is committed to solving natural resource challenges locally and globally. Learn more at www.fishbio.com. And Amp.Build. Amp is a software design and engineering shop located in Chico, California. Amp creates beautiful apps for mobile and desktop devices, wearables, and the Internet of Things. Amp develops native, web, and hybrid apps on a variety of platforms. 
Chad, who co-hosts this podcast, is the agency's founder. Learn more at www.amp.build.